I'll, uh, I'll try and speak out so you can hear it on the back rows, but uh, if you have difficulties, move down. Um, I was uh, appointed already back in July, and I went to a social function, and uh, one of the guys standing next to me asked, so what are you doing? And I said, I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen. Oh, that's really cool, he replied. What have you discovered? I mean, all professors discover all sorts of cool stuff, like uh, the Higgs particle, water on Mars, and antibiotics. And uh, fortunately, he kept on babbling. So I, I avoided to answer the question. But today, today I'm ready to, uh, to give a good reply because I'll take you on a very exciting journey. Journey started back in 2008, where we discovered or identified a very exciting trait. And uh, today, we already know the genetics behind it. So that's exciting, I think. Um, Nils has probably partly mentioned that uh, we are doing other stuff than just the research. Nevertheless, that took up 80% of his uh, introduction. And that's because that's essential for the professorship. But I spend probably 70% of my time teaching, which is good. I love teaching. Uh, research adds up to about 20%, perhaps, on a good day. And uh, then we also have to serve the wider society. Uh, some people do that more than others. I probably, I mean, if I count the hours over the year, it's probably 1%. And then Tony Sol would say, but that's only 95%, 91%, sorry. <laughs> What's the remaining time? That's serving on various committees. It's time consuming, but I love it because that's a way we have some influence on the direction of the university in the future. So rather than giving you a kaleidoscopic overview of my whole career, I decided to focus on 2017. In 2017, I've been involved in 21 studies, studies which are either published or already submitted to international journals. Um, some of them are on freshwater ecology. There's a study from the Bodensee, from Lake Constance in southern Germany, but also from Denmark and Australia on water quality in, uh, in lakes. But the majority is actually on marine ecology. Still plants, though. But the focus of this lecture today will be on general plant biology themes, because I'm also very interested in flood tolerance of crops or on natural wetland plants, doesn't really matter. And I'm doing that in Denmark, Australia, and Japan. So that's the focus of the uh, topic today. And then rather than thanking everyone, by the end of the introduction, I made this graphics because I'm not doing all this by myself, certainly not. So this year, I worked together with 93 people, 93 different co-authors. 56 of them were actually new. And probably 12 to 15 of them I've never met. It's all by email. But they're there. And uh, this cup, oops, that's the one I can't see. Look at that, that's red. This is better. Each note over here represents a unique co-author. But you can also see that there are four names highlighted here. Kolmba from the University of Western Australia, Conorup, Winkel, and Herzog from uh, our little group at the Freshwater Biological Laboratory. But Kai, for example, Kai San Jensen is sitting over here, and Nils Peter is sitting uh, here somewhere. So they're all, they're all there. Yes, it's correct that I've done lots of stuff during my career. I've listed the topic. When people normally ask, I would mention the one above, ecology and physiology of freshwater plants. And again, it doesn't really matter whether, that, whether that's in freshwaters or in seawaters. But recently, I have more and more focus on semi-aquatic systems, either systems that are permanently semi-aquatic or systems that become wet every now and then during floods. Um, lately, also climate-smart crops, because we need I think we need to prepare ourselves for a future where we have many more floods 
uh, they know that in the States already. But as I mentioned before, the topic of today's lecture is the trait that somehow confer flood tolerance to terrestrial plants. Okay, it started back in 2008 when Tim Kalmer came to the University of Copenhagen for a research sabbatical. He was here for four weeks, and we needed to, found a to find a topic. And we knew that there was a paper from 87 that had started this feature, but uh, apart from that single paper, the topic died out. So we took that up, and that has led to more than 20 publications afterwards, and a total of 7 million Danish kroner in grants, most of them here in Denmark, but also in Australia and Japan. That has been very exciting. So it's all about leaf gas films, and here we have a floating uh, leaf, uh, and you can see the fly is looking down into the tunnel, and that's because the leaf is super hydrophobic. Look at the, all the small water droplets here. So many leaves of terrestrial plants are super hydrophobic. It sheds water, and uh, that removes dirt and dust particles during rain. Actually, it's believed that this feature has evolved as a self-cleansing mechanism. We can manipulate the hydrophobicity by treating the leaf with a dilute detergent. In this case, it's, uh, it's Triton X. And then the water is not shedded anymore. The water accumulates on top of the leaf, so the leaf is actually drowning. So it does make sense that this feature has evolved for terrestrial uh, plants over time. Hydrophobic means literally do not like water. And that's, that's how bad it is for this uh, leaf segment. And you might think that's because it's full of gas. No, the gas is actually outside. I'll show that to you later on. It takes a little bit of skill to put the leaf segments into the vials, but now you can actually see this silvery, shiny surface here, and that's the leaf gas film, a thin layer of gas. If you take the leaf segment, which was treated with Triton X, it'll sink like a rock. So the gas that makes it buoyant is definitely on the exterior of the leaf. That's for sure. Yes, uh, unfortunately, the little fly cannot escape into that tunnel. That would, that would be beautiful if it could, but the gas layer is only approximately 50 to 100 microns in dimensions. So there's not room enough to do that, but it's a beautiful photo. This is probably the most exciting, <laughs> it's not the most exciting, it's the most important slide. Because if you don't understand the concept of this model, it's hard to follow the rest of the lecture. So please try and pay some attention now. This is a cross-section of a leaf. All terrestrial leaves have what we call a stoma. So it's a small vent that allows gases to be exchanged between the interior of the leaf and the exterior. That's necessary because all leaves are covered by a thin cuticle that makes them gas impermeable. So that's a small valve here. But because of the super hydrophobic leaf surface, we have this gas film here <coughs> forming on top of the leaf. And the function of that is to serve as a large surface area for CO2 to be captured. Once it's inside the gas space, it diffuses 10,000 fold faster than in water. <coughs> So the big trick is to overcome the resistance in the surrounding water here. Inside the leaf, we have photosynthesis, so oxygen is produced, and that's also escaping the gas film or the gas basis very quickly and diffuses slowly in the surrounding water. So without this gas film, the gas exchange with the interior of the leaf would be much, much slower, and it would be rate limiting. But because of the super hydrophobic leaf surfaces, this thin gas film is retained when underwater, and thereby the leaf doesn't drown. Some leaf without gas films, we actually have water infiltration, so the substomatal cavity is full of water. Okay, one of the first experiments back in 2009 uh, was on rice. I think this is rice. Let's assume it is. So we positioned a microelectrode down the root 
of this rise. And then we had it all lying in a gutter, so we could submerge the chute if we wanted to. And that's exactly what we wanted. And this is what's ha what is happening in the light. We have about 12 kilopascals of oxygen inside the root. That's approximately half of the oxygen present in atmospheric air. When we submerge it, the oxygen inside the leaf is actually increasing. And that's because there's still some resistance to outward diffusion from the gas film. So some of the oxygen produced in the chute would rather diffuse into the root because there's lower resistance along that path. And that's why the oxygen increases upon submergence. But then when we remove the gas film by brushing with this detergent with the Triton X, then there's a lower amount of CO2 entering the leaf and therefore also a lower production rate of oxygen. So oxygen inside the root is then decreasing. And we are showing that we haven't done any harm to the leaf because when we desubmerge, when we lift the chute back into the air, it finds back to exactly the same level. So that's beautiful. If we do the same thing in darkness, it looks a bit different. Start out in light, switch off the light. There's not much difference between light and darkness as long as the chute is in air. But then when we submerge it, oxygen decreases dramatically. And it goes down, in this case, to approximately 10% of air equilibrium. Then we have to manipulate the leaf, brushing it with the detergent. So this little peak is because I have to lift the, the chute out of the water, brush it with Tartan X, and then submerge it again. And the chute reacts immediately. So that's why we have this little oxygen peak. But once it's submerged, virtually all of the oxygen disappear, so the leaf cannot, can no longer take up oxygen from the surrounding flood water. Again, we bring it back into air and we restore the oxygen tension inside the root. So that's all very good. Actually, I came back and was very proud and told Kai about it, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's very good. I mean, you discover traits, mechanisms, features every day, but are they of any importance? People don't know. So I had to go into the field situation and ask the question whether the gas film also form in a natural situation, and if so, are they of any importance? And uh, back to this floating sweet grass, uh, Glyceria fluitans. Yes, gas film actually forms. Oh, that's really poor. I'll try and uh, bring down the lights here in the center, so it's more obvious. Underwater, again, we can observe the silvery appearance, but uh, for this species, gas film is only formed on one side of the leaf. There are small bubbles, and that's uh, derived from underwater photosynthesis. If we go for a swim in a rice paddy, it's the same thing. This is a rice paddy from the Philippines that we could submerge on our demand. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about the it's a Dolmen movie, this one, but uh, you can still see the silvery sheen on the, on the leaves and also the gas bubbles, which are due to underwater photosynthesis. So, so yes, yes, indeed, uh, it does appear also in the field situation. And in order to, to verify whether it also has some quantitative importance, uh, we went into the uh, Watton Sea. And uh, here we have a population of Spartina. So like the previous photo I showed you, we positioned the micro sensors, the micro oxygen electrodes, this time into the root, or, sorry, into the rhizome. And then Anna started brushing the whole clone with Triton X in order to remove the surface tension from the whole clone. And then a neighboring clone over here uh, was used as a control so that one was allowed to form gas films during submersions. The beauty of this thing is that these plants are sometimes submerged twice every day due to tidal submergence. The tide is coming in. So there's no way that this plant could prepare itself by, by producing aquatic leaves, aquatic leaves that we know from truly submerged plants, because they would simply desiccate during low tide. So they do need a feature that enables them to survive, do photosynthesis, and most of all, I guess, to take up oxygen from the surrounding water during high tide. This is almost completely submerged, so this is how it looks. 
If we first focus on the light situation then. So we started out around noon, 12 o'clock, and this graph up here is showing, is showing the light. But what is interesting is the three gray lines here and the three green lines. The gray lines are the ones that were treated with Triton X, so they do not form the gas film. And uh, this stipple line here denotes complete submergence. So that's when the tide is high and the whole population is underwater. And as you can see, hopefully, the three plants that were treated uh, with the detergent are systematically lower in rhizome PO2. Looks quite similar during the day, uh, sorry, during the night. <laughs> so in this case, we worked late in the evening, did the same thing, and then the tide during nighttime came in. So it's dark here, right? This is sunrise the following day around seven o'clock in the morning. And also here you can see a dramatic effect of internal oxygen inside the plant. Uh, if we remove the gas film or prevent that the gas films form during high tide. So that's all good. So I think we could conclude on this study that these gas films are essential in order to keep a good uh, oxygen status of the below ground tissues. Then Anas and I teamed up with Kim from the Niels Bohr Institute and Torsten, I think they're both here today, and we went to Switzerland because we wanted to visualize the leaf gas films. It's very hard to make cross-sections and observe the cross-sections in a microscope. Yeah, we can do that of the tissue, but we can't make cross-sections of the gas films, right? They simply disappear. So we went to this very advanced system here. It's a synchrotron. So it's a particle accelerator, and then the physicists have installed some big magnets over here, so they can direct X-ray in this tiny tube here into a stage. And the close-up here is actually the that's also spatina, uh, confined in a little uh, in a little glass vial and submerged into water. I think you can see that there's a tiny silver sheen. So it's simply whacked with X-ray. And then uh, there's a detector sitting over here. The principle is that gas has almost no absorption of X-ray, whereas the tissue does. So there's huge contrast between gas and tissue. And this is actually how it looks. If we focus on the gas film here, that's the exterior gas, then all this is actually just the uh, that's a raw image from the X-ray uh, or from a CT scan. Oh, it's not a CT scanner. Tim would kill me. Um, it's a yeah from from the system. <laughs> so you see, there's very fine, uh, very fine resolution here. It looks like a cross section from a microscope, but then the uh, the purple stuff up here. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm colorblind, but. The, the spatina leaf has a plyoside leaf, so much of the gas is, is actually trapped inside the grooves here. But it's all interconnected by a fine mesh, so a um, fine mess of gas. So oxygen and CO2 can easily diffuse in gas space in between the grooves and down into the grooves because that's where the stomata are sitting. This one up here is simply showing the internal gas spaces. That's all good. So what is the challenge? Because we have a system here where it seems that the terrestrial plants are doing very well underwater. But that's not the case because the gas film does not live forever. Not at all, in fact. This is rice. And uh, this is the thickness of the gas film. So a little less than 100 microns, a tenth of a millimeter initially. But then you see after a few days, the thickness decreases dramatically. Uh, there's a little bit of genetic difference between a tolerant variety and the intolerant variety, but it's not much. But it's sufficiently promising in order to try and identify the genetic regulation of this trait. Because if there are some genetic differences, then we can use that uh, in our work towards producing more flood tolerant uh, cultivars or crops in the future. But look at it, all the gas is gone between five and seven days of submergence. So it's not a feature that uh, stays forever. 
And now it becomes a bit more difficult, I'm afraid, and that's why I call it rocket science, because, as I just said, if we can, if we can manipulate the superhydrophobic properties of the leaves, then we can actually use it. If there were no differences between the cultivars, there would be no avenue for doing this. Because there's some difference, it's actually quite promising. And we were able to identify a mutant. A mutant is, is simply another plant that hasn't got this feature, hasn't got this trait. It has been whacked with chemicals or whacked with uh, radioactivity. And uh, then we have lots of mutations and uh, sometimes most of the time, actually, the plants are just dying. But in some rare cases, we're actually able to produce a mutant that has a knockout on that, uh, on that gene. So that's very interesting. This is how it looks. It's a bit complicated, but I'll try and lead you by the hand. I'll stand over here. Did you finish reading the slide? So up here, we have the wild type. That's this panel up here. So that's a standard rice plant. If we dip that into water, we have a gas film forming. After 10 minutes, it's still there. If we do the same thing after a day of submergence, the gas film is still there. We can quantify the hydrophobicity by measuring the contact angle. It's very similar after 10 minutes of submergence and after one day of submergence. And if we look in details on the nanostructure of the rice leaf, we can see that it's full of small wax platelets. It's the wax platelets that results in the super hydrophobic properties of the leaf surface. If we now look at the mutant, then yes, well, initially, it also seems that it's super hydrophobic. There's a gas film forming. But after one day, it's gone. And if we then look at the nanostructure, of the leaf surface, we can see that there's a significantly lower density of these wax platelets. So that's, that's probably the reason why it's losing the properties so much faster than the wild type up here that stays dry underwater for up to seven days. So um, now I don't know what I'm saying, to be honest. Uh, this graph is showing the process of trying to identify the gene. We use positional cloning, and after a few weeks, they actually realized that the interesting part was located on chromosome 11, on the long arm of chromosome 11. But the, uh, the candidate region consisted of 18 genes, 18 known genes. So that's pretty useless initially. So it took almost a year to narrow it down to this little tiny region here. And uh, this gene is actually only expressed in the expanding leaf. Look at this graph. This is relative gene expression. So how much protein, how much enzyme is this gene actually producing? And uh, that's one. We normalize it to one. In the expanding blade, it's not being expressed at all in a blade which is already fully expanded. There's a little bit of expression in the sheath and in the root. And most of all, there's huge difference between the DIP7, which is a mutant, and Kinmase, which is a wild type, the one that has a fully functioned gene. So that's all very, very beautiful. And because of the influence on the genotype, we propose to call this gene leaf gas film one. That's just the way they do it, those geneticists. So that's very cool. But the coolest part is actually this one. And now you have to concentrate, because I, I don't know why they call it this, but, but this is what is called a vector control. It's basically the same as a mutant. So it's a plant, a rice plant, that doesn't have the gene. And you see, after one day of submergence, it becomes wet. It's all good. And you also see that the surface structure looks very similar to what we had before. But now we take the gene that we have identified in the wild type, clip it out, and move it into this vector control, just that single gene. And this is what we get. 
So in the DRP7 background, the mutant background, we now have super hydrophobicity after one day of submergence. Fully restored the contact angles and fully restored the density of the wax platelets. I think that's super cool. Basically because I don't know how to do it. But, but I think it's really, really nice. So what is this gene doing? In fact, we don't know. And that's one of the reasons why it, make, why it didn't make it uh, into science or nature. We don't know. Because in order to know, we should have taken this gene and put it into a yeast cell and then observed what is the protein, what is the enzyme that this yeast cell is now producing since it has the gene. But we couldn't do that. Instead, we have analyzed the chemical substances of the wax platelets. And it looks like this. Up here, we have the kinmase, the wild type, and the mutant, the DRP7. And you see, it only differs in C30 aldehydes and C30 alcohols. The C30 alcohols are the precursors for the wax platelets, which is beautiful, I think. And we take it all the way. Here's the mutant background. And here's the mutant with the gene inserted. And as you can see, the uh, C30 Alcohol is no longer accumulating in the red one, the one with the gene. Instead, it's producing C30 alcohols instead. And in this way, it can continue the wax synthesis. I think it's beautiful. But I'm more interested in the fact that we can also restore the phenotype. Because after all, that's what's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, if we look at the uh, vector control here, there's no gas film. Once we have inserted the gene into that vector control, gas film thickness is fully restored after one day of submergence. And so is underwater photosynthesis. And that's what it's all about. It's about the plant's ability to produce carbohydrates when submerged into water. So why is all that so interesting? It's basically because, as I said initially, there will be many more floods in the future. They know that in the States already, although it seems that they don't consider it a serious threat anymore. But if you look at this beautiful, I don't know if you can see it, but it becomes increasingly more red in all the regions where we have big rivers, the Amazonas, Mississippi, the Yangtze, the Mekong, and all these big rivers. That's where we have floods, but also in Europe. Maybe it's more visible on the graph over here. The only continent that has not experienced many more floods during the past 50 years is actually Australia. Look at the figures, up to 350 floods per decade in Asia, in Southeast Asia. So it's very relevant indeed. And that's, why, that's how I would like to be able to contribute with my research. I would, I would love to be able to do something like this. This is rice in India. This rice variety has had a gene inserted called sub-1. And that makes it able to tolerate submergence, in this case, of up to 10 days. Because what this gene is doing is that it restricts the elongation of the plants. Normally, a rice plant would try to restore contact to the atmosphere if it gets submerged. But in this case, it doesn't. It blocks the ethylene. A reception pathway. The poor farmer to the left has a normal variety, exactly the same variety but without the gene. I think that's a success story. And this is not a GMO approach. This is actually done by normal breeding attempt. So there's no problem in releasing these varieties uh, to the wider society. So I have the idea that if we can overexpress this gene that we have identified, the leaf gas film one, if we can overexpress it, it means that it keeps on being translated also in mature leaves. Maybe you remember that the, genes, the gene was no longer uh, translated in the mature leaves, only in the expanding leaves. I think if we can do that, maybe we can then extend the period where the superhydrophobic properties of the leaves are actually maintained also during submergence. That's the idea, and that would be a fantastic contribution. This is the last slide. As I said initially, I haven't done all this all by myself, and I would like to thank a little handful of people. Uh, it will be very quick. 
First one is my mom. <laughs> She's sitting up there. Hi. She made a good move when I was 12 because I was going into a direction where I shouldn't go. And she said to my dad, we got to move out of this uh, community here. And they did. And then I met Paul X. Carmelson, which was lucky because he didn't believe much in physical fights. He believed a lot in mental and intellectual fights. And those of you who know me very well will know that I love competition. And so does Paul Eric. So we competed a lot, but not on muscles anymore. So thank you, Paul Eric. Nana, Nana Luderson, she made me an offer back in 1986 that I couldn't really um, refuse. She said, Oli, you've got to find yourself another study. I was studying vet, and it didn't work out very well. And if he hadn't pushed me, or kicked me, in fact, uh, I wouldn't have uh, changed the discipline into biology, and we would not be here. Anya is sitting up there. She, she will know that I make a lot of decisions every day, and not all of them are very um, well thought out, I could say. And I would just like to thank you for also supporting me and helping me to, uh, to get out of the, some of the tricky situations that I position myself in. It happens every now and then. Jakob and Camilla are both here today. I regret that you have paid part of the price for me being able to, to stand here today. But I hope in the end that you'll be proud of my achievements. Uh, and I hope now that I'm a full professor, I'll have much more time to, <laughs> to play with you. Jens, <laughs> Jens cemented my interest in uh, aquatic ecology, first in the compulsory field course in Saltensko, and then later on during uh, an elective course, uh, aquatic ecology. And without him, I think I would have ended up doing uh, something less interesting. And then Kai. Kai is always, uh, no, not always, but in initially he insisted that I would be able to do much better than that. I came up with my first experiment as a master student. And he looked at it briefly and said, you must be able to do better than that. Back into the basement and repeat the experiment. I did not know anything about replication at that point in time. <laughs> so I thought one was enough. It wasn't. <laughs> Nils Peter is also sitting here. Nils Peter Reuspeck sitting up there. Uh, he fostered my interest in microsensors. And that has been 50, maybe 75% of my career. So without that visit, crucial visit back in 95, I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't be here today, or at least the topic would, be, uh, would have been completely different. Thank you, Nils Peter. That was essential. And then, unfortunately, the last guy here, Tim Colmer from the University of, Com that was a University of uh, Western Australia, he has been instrumental to my success. We are working very, very well together, and uh, I, I've, I owe Tim a lot. We are having fun together and uh, making good stories, and that's what it's all about. I would like to thank you for your attention, at, uh, attendance and uh, also thank the Carlsberg Foundation, the, the uh, Danish Science Council, and the Willem Foundation for supporting uh, my career. Thank you very much.